The last unrestored machine from the old workshop in our house is a shaper or spindle molder. I hadn't had any use for it for a long time. I had removed it from its original location and parked it in a corner here. It wasn't even clear to me whether all the machine parts and tools were still complete. But my curiosity to learn more about that machine finally won. A saw blade was still attached to its spindle. The very massive spindle goes vertically through the entire base. Here it was driven by a belt that is surprisingly long. This is because the axis of the motor was not also vertical but horizontal. With the long belt it was possible to make a 90 degrees turn. The motor is also still there. An old induction motor from the company Glaser von Braun. Like the one I found at the bandsaw. Such motors are cheaper if their bearings are only designed for horizontal installation of the motor, hence the long belt. The power of the motor is 3 kW at a speed of 1500 rpm. With the diameter of the belt pulley and that of the spindle, it turns out that it runs at only 4000 rpm. Well, the machine is quite old. Today's shapers usually run faster. I kept everything that seemed to belong to the machine on shelves. As you might know, I had taken over the old workshop in a state of disarray and had to gather the machine parts from all corners. Here are the cutter heads, some of which still look ok. Others seem a bit dangerous, but more about that later. First I was looking for the assembly tool for the cutters on the spindle. Here it is. However, the spindle has to be locked to change tools and after a bit of researching I found a bolt that clearly revealed that it had exactly this purpose. So I started disassembling the tool that was mounted 50 years ago. But how does that unscrew? The direction of rotation resulted from the saw teeth, so it was clear that it unscrews in that direction. It remained difficult because the nut was firmly stuck. But together we finally succeeded. After removing the saw blade, insert rings appeared in the table, with which one can change the opening for cutters of different sizes. In order to get to the spindle more easily, I had to examine the bearings and so on, I unscrewed the table from its base. The table itself is very heavy. We attached an electric winch to the roof construction, then it came off easily. It was only now that I realized that the spindle consists of a spindle part with bearings and a milling arbor inserted in it. The nut that holds the milling arbor could be opened easily with the special tool. But before I finally loosened the milling arbor, I removed the flange washer and an intermediate ring. And I tested the height adjustment of the spindle. A very massive construction that still works perfectly. The milling arbor has a diameter of 25 mm suitable for my cutter heads. But now to the extraction of the milling arbor. The nut here is something very special. It has two threads with different pitches so that it drives the cone of the arbor into a corresponding socket. And conversely it also drives it out when unscrewing. A little engineering marvel that I saw here for the first time. I carefully measured the milling arbor and also determined the exact shape of the cone. What is interesting is that such cones will hold themselves in their sockets by friction alone, if the angle is shallow enough. Some old taper standards are still in use, such as the so-called Morse tapers. They are named after their inventor, the mechanical engineer Stefan Morse. I measured the cone diameter in 
10 millimeter increments and determined the cone pitch very accurately using linear regression. Finally, it was clear that this is the so-called MK4, a Morse taper number 4 corresponding to the standard at the time. Now I had to deal with the motor. As an induction motor, it was switched on, as usual, with a star delta circuit with three-phase power. I removed all connections and remeasured the windings resistances. For a 3 kW motor, the values seemed plausible to me, so I wired the motor in a star. It ran decently, but I wasn't entirely happy with the noise. Maybe one of the bearings has a slight damage. The pulley, made of two hardwood parts, braced against each other, was particularly worth seeing. The use of wooden wheels here is not a problem, but I couldn't leave this one the way it was. It ran out of true and I would have preferred a slightly larger one. So I dismantled it. Then I have another very important machine part, the power feeder. Ideally, the shaper is operated in such a way that the pieces are guided along the cutter head with the feeder, which is safer. This device was fitted with a very strange historical plug. When I wanted to connect a new one, I found that the cables were completely brittle. For connecting new cables, I had to open the switch. Only then did I notice that the switch can run the motor in two speeds. This is possible with induction motors using the so-called Dahlander circuit. For the first speed, the six motor windings are connected in delta, so that there are always two in series. Due to the arrangement of the windings, the motor has four magnetic poles. By switching to the so-called double star, the six windings become parallel in pairs and the number of poles drops to two. This gives the motor twice the speed, because the frequency of the three-phase current remains the same. And reverse operation is also possible in both operating modes by exchanging two phases. So the thing seems to work. What remains to be clarified is the condition of the spindle bearings. Both have lubricators that are still full of grease. The type of lubrication suggested that ball bearings are actually installed here. Opening the pop bearing cover proved that to be true. After my experiences with the old bandsaw and the planer, I didn't expect that this machine would have modern ball bearings. But unlike the other machines, it was probably not built around 1900, but in the 1930s. This circumstance is of course very convenient for me if I want to bring the thing back to life. However, something else is not so practical. From the many cutter heads that I have, only a few can be considered safe by today's standards. There are many aspects at stake here. The attachment of the blades must be self-locking and there must be chip thickness limits to reduce the risk of kickback. So my cutters are mostly mm, useless. When I want to buy New ones, however, I have the problem that modern cutter heads all have a 30mm bore and my milling arbor has only the old standard of 25mm. So what to do? Is it worth repairing this machine? I have to think about it.